for maintaining the two rotor assemblies and related controls of the HUP service type helicopter. These procedures, which make up the most essential phase of any helicopter maintenance, include removing rotor assemblies, reinstalling rotor assemblies, and adjusting flight control cable tension. You will follow these procedures as part of certain periodic checks, or at any time it is necessary to remedy trouble reported on the pilot's post-flight report. Before you begin this maintenance operation, assemble all the tools you are going to use and place them near the helicopter. Place the erection and maintenance manual nearby for handy reference. You will begin the removing phase of maintenance by removing the rotor blades of the forward rotor. The after rotor blades are removed in the same way. Here are the procedures you will follow. It is recommended that blades be removed while in the unfolded position. This will prevent the possibility of damage to the pitch control arm should the blade be dropped while still attached to the arm. Support each end of the blade during removal. Set the collective pitch lever in the neutral position and make small adjustments up and down to assist locking the pitch lock pin as it is pushed in. Remove the inboard snubber attaching bolt. Then swing the snubber outboard and against the blade spar. Remove the shield from the top of the vertical pin. Bend the tang of the lock washer down and remove the lock nut from the lower end of the vertical pin. Then remove the horizontal bolt which locks the vertical pin in the blade root socket. Remove the vertical pin from above using the puller specified in the erection and maintenance manual. Remove the blade by sliding its root end horizontally out of the pitch bearing housing. All blades, when removed, should be lowered to the deck carefully and placed in a blade rack. Now you are ready for the next removing operation. Removing the flap restrainers. The restrainers and hub can be removed as an assembly, but to illustrate the component parts, the method of first removing the restrainers as a unit will be shown. First. Remove the three bolts which secure the assembly to the hub. Then remove the three bolts which secure the dampers to the blade pitch shaft. Now lift the assembly from the helicopter. You will check for oil leaks and security of attachment. If leakage occurs, individual dampers should be renewed. Your next removing operation is to remove the rotor hub. To do this, you first disconnect the pitch links from the swash plate by removing the bolts at their lower end. Then remove the bolts which secure the rotor hub and the droop stops to the rotor shaft. There are three sets of these. The three droop stops are fully released when these bolts are removed. However, before you remove the droop stops, you must support the pitch bearing assemblies with wooden blocks to prevent their dropping on the hub. When they have been properly supported, attach a hoist to the special plate. Hoist the assembly clear of the rotor shaft and lower it onto the work stand. Lubrication is the only work done on the rotor hub assembly in the field. For any repairs involving disassembly, the unit must be returned to overhaul. Another essential removing operation is the removing of the snubbers. These must be kept in matched sets of three. Remove the bolt which holds the outboard end of the snubber assembly to a bracket on the blade root socket. Timing of the snubbers is done at overhaul. Now we begin the reinstalling phase by reinstalling the snubbers in the same matched sets of three. Tighten the snubber outboard bolt tight enough so that it offers just a slight resistance when turned with a wrench. 
do not turn it any tighter. Your next step is the reinstallation of the rotor hub assembly. Hoist the hub assembly over the shaft. Mount it on top of the rotor shaft. Set the three droop stops in position and install and tighten the bolts which secure the droop stops and hub to the rotor shaft. Bolt each of the three pitch links at their lower ends where they connect to the swash plate. Now you reinstall the flap restrainers. This is accomplished simply by reversing the manner of their removal. Now you proceed to reinstall the rotor blades. First, you must set the blade angle of incidence. This means that the blades must be adjusted in their root sockets to form the correct angle between the center line of the hinge point and the center line of the blade. To perform this adjustment, you will use a blade adjustment jig secured to a beam or wall so that the center line of the vertical pin will be exactly vertical. Mount the blades in the jig. Support the tip end of the blade in a stand. About four feet in from the blade end, support the blade on the stand base so that it can pivot as the blade angle is changed. The adjustment procedure is as follows. Place the protractor base and inclinometer on the one half inch line, which is painted across the cord. 55 and 3 quarter inches inboard from the blade tip. Next, loosen the two set screws and the cuff bolts on the blade root socket. Attach the special blade adjusting wrench on the blade spar tube and adjust the blade angle, consulting your E&M manual for proper fore and aft blade settings. This procedure is for the initial adjustment of all blades on both forward and aft rotors. Some final adjustment may be necessary after the blades have been installed and tracked. This stencil mark on the after side of the blade at the spar entrance into the split sleeve and socket is used to record the blade movement from its original setting. Now tighten the two cuff bolts which clamp the blade socket to the blade tube to a torque of 200 to 250 inch pounds. Also, tighten the two set screws in the root socket. Check the blade angle again to be certain it has not changed while the clamp bolts were being tightened. Tag the blades for easy identification. Now you're ready to attach the blades to the aircraft. Blades must always be installed in balanced sets of three. If the pitch lock pins have been removed, they must be reinstalled. Slide the root end of the blade into place in the end of the pitch bearing housing. Support the blade and insert the bearing washer under the head of the vertical pin. Then carefully insert the pin into place from the top of the pitch bearing housing. If the needle bearing assembly is pushed out during installation of the pin, it is an indication that the pin is not being aligned properly. The pin should then be removed and the bearings pressed back into their proper place before attempting further installation of the pin. Line up the needle bearing so that the pin can be installed freely without forcing it. Next, Line up the locking hole in the vertical pin with the hole in the blade root end. Then insert and secure the horizontal lock bolt. Put the bearing washer over the end of the vertical pin and set the tab lock washer into place on the base of the pin. Use the special spanner wrench to tighten the nut. Be sure it is locked firmly in place. After the nut is tightened, Rotate the lower bearing washer to see that the nut is against the shoulder of the vertical pin and is not binding in the pitch bearing housing. Finally, install the shield over the vertical pin. 
tighten the nut. Attach the snubber assembly and secure its inboard end to the bracket on the pitch bearing housing. The rotor blades have now been installed. The procedures just described for removing the blades, checking their angle of incidence, and reinstalling them is the same for both the forward and after rotor systems. Now let's take up adjusting flight control cable tension. To do this, you should always work with the longest convenient span. The best span for checking the forward cable runs is located in the cabin overhead. In checking cable tensions, you must first identify the cable with the color code chart in the e &M manual. Let's start with the lateral pitch control cable. The color code markings on the cables are located on the cable terminals. Making sure you have the right cable, install the tensiometer and adjust the tension to the value shown in the e &M manual for the temperature you are working with by tightening or loosening the cable turnbuckle. Shake the cable several times as you adjust to the proper tension to obtain an accurate reading. Make sure that not more than three threads show beyond the turnbuckle barrel ends. Secure the turnbuckles temporarily with lock wire until a hovering flight test has been made. The longitudinal and collective pitch cables are identified, tension to proper value, and lock wired in the same manner. You are now ready to check the after cable runs. Reach into the engine compartment through the exhaust air opening. The cables and turnbuckles are located on the port side of the compartment. Identify tension and lock wire the cables just as you did before, referring to your e &M manual tables where necessary. Now you make a functional check of the controls by moving the cyclic control stick. Collective pitch stick and rudder pedals through their full travel. Finally, you will track the blades of both rotors to make sure they are operating in an even path. A final check of your work will be given in the test flight. Do not fail to permanently lock wire all turnbuckles after the test flight. This film has reviewed the basic procedures for maintaining the rotors of the HUP service type helicopter. These procedures included removing the hub assemblies, reinstalling them, and adjusting the flight control cables. Removing the assemblies included removing the rotor blades, removing the flap restrainers, removing the hub assemblies, and removing the dampers. Reinstalling included reinstalling the dampers, reinstalling the hub assemblies, reinstalling the flap restrainers, checking the blade angle of incidence, and reinstalling the blades. Adjusting the flight control cables included identifying the proper cables setting them to the correct tension, and finally making a functional check of the controls. You will follow these procedures as part of certain periodic checks, or at any time it is necessary to remedy trouble reported on the pilot's post-flight report. We cannot emphasize too strongly the importance of assembling the proper tools before you begin work and of choosing a workspace that affords you sufficient room. Again, because of the extremely close tolerances to which you will work, we must stress the importance of exercising the utmost care at all times, of referring whenever necessary to your erection and maintenance manual, and of using the proper tool for each particular phase of the job.